we now go on to the la most important and uh, most awaited lecture. And uh, whenever we ask something, uh, CRF, uh, the B with Martin Leon or Greg Stone, they're always uh, ready to help us. I requested them to come, but somehow because of our pressures, and various other things, they couldn't be here. But they immediately agreed to do this evening symposium. is symposium on stent technology, uh, newer stent uh, uh, technologies, newer stent designs. I, re I request uh, our uh, senior uh, uh, doctor here, Dr. Uh, Vijay Bang and Vijay Ayer and Dr. K M Kereti, to come uh, to chair the sessions. And other panelists who are there, anybody is here, you can please join mentioned here, Sriman Narayana, Kamal Pasha, Neeraj Prasad, Gulam Azad, Azam, I think he's from Bangladesh. Please request him to come. And uh, Luca Testa, actually, he had to leave. Uh, he has, uh, went early. And uh, with this, uh, oh, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, morning to you. I'm Dr. Srinivas Kumar here. Are you connected? Can you see? Can you, I, we can see you, sir. And can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can hear you. Yeah. Thanks for sparing your time, sir. A slightly five minutes delay, I uh, should feel apologize for it. And please go ahead and now we have a, a senior cha chairpersons here. We are eagerly listening to your lecture, Evolution of STEM Technology and Next Steps for Improvement. Over to you, sir. Well, welcome, everybody. It's uh, fantastic to be able to deliver this lecture to this amazing conference. I, I truly wish I could be there with you now. Uh, I, I would have a lot more fun uh, rather than being here in New York where it is probably hotter. I'm sure it's hotter than it is in India. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, the next best thing is to be able to speak to you remotely and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I will go over um, uh, where we are with STEM technology, how we got here, and where I think we'll be going. Uh, first, I'd like to take us back, all the way back to Zurich, Switzerland where on September 16, 1977, Andreas Grunzig, of course, performed the first balloon angioplasty. And this was really a remarkable achievement, and this proximal LED got a pretty good result in Andreas um, Bumbach, the first patient, and this was well-preserved. No restenosis at 10 years later. But of course, this was almost the exception rather than rule, and the Achilles heel of balloon angioplasty was acute closure and severe dissections of the artery, which was the mechanism of balloon angioplasty. But unfortunately, uncontrollable acute closure after PTCA occurred in 5 to 10 percent of cases, which often led to emergency surgery. Uh, many of you are too young to remember this, but it was a very harrowing time um, where a lot of our patients did not do well because of it. Fortunately, stents were developed, initially the Cook GR2 stent to take care of acute closure, and then the Palma shot stent, which was also shown to reduce restenosis. And it's truly amazing now to look back on these first two devices, the first two that were widely used anyway, to see how rudimentary they were. But nonetheless, they worked in many cases, and they clearly reduced um, uh, these two adverse events and improved outcomes. But the Achilles heel of bare metal stents was restenosis because of the greater trauma to the media that was actually caused by the um, bare metal stent implantation into the vessel. It actually provoked more late loss than with balloon angioplasty. And restenosis would still occur in up to 50% of patients depending on the complexity of the lesion. So of course, first generation drug eluting stents were then introduced to overcome the problem of restenosis. We describe these as three component devices, the stent platform itself, initially these were all very thick stainless steel, then the polymer, initially they were durable polymers which controlled the dosing and the elution kinetics of the anti-proliferative drug. And the first two drugs, of course, were paclitaxel and sirolimus. And these devices, when they worked, were quite extraordinary. You would get the acute result of the stent. That was no different with a drug-eluting coating. But then it would basically freeze or preserve that result to one year, to two years, to four years, to seven years. And the initial series of 100 cases that were done in the Ravel study showed a 0% restenosis rate in very simple lesions. So this was an extraordinary advance. Um, this led to, of course, large randomized trials of bare metal stents versus drug eluting stents. I led most of the TAXIS trials, and when we combined all the outcomes of the TAXIS trials versus bare metal stents, we saw that these um, effectively reduced clinically driven target lesion revascularization, which is the clinical surrogate of restenosis, by about 50%. And you can see this was a durable effect out to five years with the curves not diverging. 
but we were equally honest in, in reporting some of the problems with these new drug-eluting stents, and that particularly was very late stent thrombosis. That was stent thrombosis occurring greater than one year. So here, you know, this happens to be a cipher stent, a circumflex lesion, two stents put in, great result, patient well until suddenly at 3.5 years develops a stent thrombosis. And we showed in the TAXIS trials that stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction were not significantly different up to one year, but then from one year to five years, there was an increased incidence with drug-eluting stents compared to bare metal stents. And this was true with both Cypher and Taxis. We learned that there were many reasons for this, but the two biggest reasons are that, number one, drug-eluting stents were so effective at inhibiting um, uh, hyperplasia, it also inhibited endothelial cell coverage. And only about 40% of this drug-eluting stent surface would be covered with endothelial cells, which of course have antithrombotic properties, compared to bare metal stents where 100% of the struts are covered. In addition, there was inflammation um, and positive vessel remodeling due to the vascular toxicity from the drugs and the polymers themselves. And this could again lead to positive remodeling and underlying inflammation in the vessel. There was abnormal vasomotion and all of this predisposed to poor healing and very late stent thrombosis. Fortunately, the companies were able to develop better second-generation drug-eluting stents. Uh, first, they did change the underlying platforms. Most of them became cobalt chromium, much more thin struts that were led to more rapid endothelialization and less underlying medial trauma. But second, the polymers, which were initially all durable polymers, were much more biocompatible. They were much less likely to um, induce inflammation. The drugs shifted to the limuses, and the limuses and the drugs are not that different from initial sirolimus, um, but they have a wide toxic therapeutic ratio, and so they're very safe. And we did a series of trials, um, the SPEAR trials um, and the COMPARE trials in Europe, which compared, for example, the Zion's Everolimus eluting stent to the Taxis Paclitax eluting stent, and we saw overall substantially reduced rates of MACE, and this was due to both enhanced efficacy with lower target lesion revascularization, as well as a much greater safety profile. And the stent thrombosis rates were reduced by about 70% compared to the earlier devices because of all of these improvements. So, it's now 2019. Why do we need even better stents? Well, first, we want to further eliminate early and late stent thrombosis and restenosis. We do not have 0% rates of either of these events. Second, we all know that because of this ongoing risk of late stent thrombosis, in some situations, patients have to be on long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. And we know that this causes bleeding, and we know that bleeding is associated with mortality as well. We'd like to have no dual antiplatelet therapy if necessary. And we want to improve the lifelong prognosis of drug-eluting stents because there is an ongoing risk of stent-related events arising from the stent site even with contemporary drug-eluting stents. And I'll come back to this. So to further improve drug-eluting stent outcomes, we're looking at four different possible pathways. One, maybe we can make the stent struts even thinner still, ultra-thin. Two, perhaps bioabsorbable polymers will be beneficial. Let the polymer totally disappear over time so there can't be any very late polymer effects. Or we can eliminate the polymer altogether. If the polymer is the cause of some of these adverse outcomes, can we deliver the drug without the polymer? Or perhaps we should just eliminate the stent itself. The concept of bioresorbable scaffolds allow the vessel to return to its native underlying vascular architecture, which can have normal glagovian remodeling, vascular adaptive responses, vasomotion, etc. So let's look at these. So first of all, if we look at the evolution of metallic drug-eluting stents, looking at the thickness, they used to be very, very thick. Taxis and Cypher, 130 to even 150 microns thick, just the metallic stent itself. And over time, they've gotten quite thin, such that we're down to about 60 microns with some of the newest ultra-thin devices. The, the classic... Um, second generation stents are in the 80 to 90 micron range, but now we've gotten down as low as 60 to 70. If you look at the polymers, the materials have changed and we've explored durable polymers and biodegradable polymers, and the polymers have also gotten substantially thinner, as low as 3 to 4 microns thin, so less polymer burden. 
And then finally, the antiproliferative drugs really have not changed, although basically everyone has gone to sirolimus because it again has a wider toxic therapeutic ratio and it's more potent than paclitaxel. So we did a meta-analysis of 10 randomized trials in 11,658 patients of randomized trials of three different ultra-thin stent drug-eluting stents, those that are less than 70 microns, compared to the classic second-generation drug-eluting stents. And here's all the data. This is the one-year rate of target lesion failure. And you can see it looks a little bit better with the ultra-thin strut DES, about 16% better. The upper bound of the confidence interval is 0.99, so this is not strong evidence, but it's suggestive evidence that ultra-thin devices may be a little bit better. And if you look at one-year stent thrombosis, it didn't quite reach statistical significance, but again, the trend is in the right direction for a 26% reduction in stent thrombosis. Now, that would be wonderful, but we now have a, a very large randomized trial, the largest in this space, which is not yet reflected in this data, and that is this one which is by, uh, the Bionics randomized trial of Orsiro, which is 60 microns, versus Onyx, which is over 80 microns. 2,488 randomized patients, absolutely no difference in target vessel failure, and, if, and there was a difference in stent thrombosis, but it actually was less with Onyx compared to Orsiro. Now, this was, as you can see here, um, you know, about seven versus one events. This may just be totally due to play of chance, but nonetheless, if there is a difference between um, stent thrombosis or target lesion failure with ultra-thin uh, drug-eluting stents compared to thin strut drug-eluting stents, it's likely to be small. And the one other piece of data that we have was also from the Synergy Evolve trial, and that showed no difference either. So it's likely to be a very small difference, if any, and that to me wouldn't drive the selection of a stent right now. What about bioabsorbable polymers? Well, we also looked at a meta-analysis of 89 randomized trials and 85,000 patients of bioabsorbable polymer drug-eluting stents. And if we looked at stent thrombosis, well, they look pretty good compared to bare metal stents and paclitaxel-eluting stents, but when we get to current-generation drug-eluting stents, there's really no difference. The, probably the, the best trial and the best a stent, or one of the best stents using a biodegradable polymer is the Synergy stent. This is very thin, it's 74 microns, it's very conformable, platinum chromium. It's got a very ultra-thin four micron layer of uh, bioabsorbable PLGA, which goes away in, in four months. The drug's released over three months, so it's a very, very good device. And when you look at it in the 1684 patient randomized Evolve 2 trial of Synergy versus Promet Promus element, target lesion failure and stent thrombosis at five years were identical. So it doesn't seem like bioabsorbable polymers are any better than contemporary durable polymers in terms of long-term outcomes. What about polymer-free metallic stents? Well, the concept of a polymer-free metallic stent is that once the drug's eluded, a bare metal stent's left behind. There's no polymer. And maybe this would lead to more uniform drug delivery because the polymer can get bunched up or can get even scraped off if it's being as it's being delivered to the lesion. So that is going to lead to non-uniform drug delivery. So maybe the drug delivery will be more uniform without a polymer. There can't be any adverse polymer reactions if there's no polymer. And maybe it will lead to more rapid healing and shorter mandatory duration of DAPT. But the potential disadvantages are is that without a polymer, it's difficult to control the drug dose and the elution rate, and some polymers are thromboresistant and may actually promote healing. So the most studied um, polymer-free device so far is the BioFreedom drug-coated stent. This is still um, a first-generation device that was studied in many ways. It was 120 micron thick stainless steel, so not really a contemporary platform, and it's thicker than the current generation devices. But it has this very unique micro-etched or um, architectured surface which holds the drug in these abluminal surface structures only against the wall of the artery. And this was designed to elute Biolimus A9, which is a nice serolimus analog, but it's very lipophilic. So small amounts of it, if you can get it to the site of the lesion, it, the lesion will, the cells will avidly hold on to it compared to other um, uh, drug-eluting stents, other limuses. So it has rapid drug transfer to the vessel wall, 98% within one month, and 
I, theoretically, because of all this, maybe there's no polymer, maybe you can use short DAT. And in fact, after the, um, the pilot studies, that's how it was studied in the Leaders Free study. So this was a 2,400 patient randomized trial of patients at high bleeding risk in whom the physicians thought there should only be one month DAT. And they randomized these patients to the BioFreedom drug-coated stent versus a similar prepared bare metal stent. And clearly this was a drug-eluting product. You could see that target lesion revascularization was reduced by half. Now, 5.1% is a little bit on the high side, but this was a complex high bleeding risk population. If you look at the safety outcomes, there was no difference in cardiac death, but myocardial infarction was actually somewhat lower with the um, drug-coated stent. So that's very favorable. No difference in stent thrombosis, although the stent thrombosis rates were kind of high in both groups at one year. But again, this may have been because this was a high-risk population. So it would be nice to see just how good this device is by getting some randomized trial data against contemporary DES uh, with either regular duration DAFT or short-term DAFT. So we have one such trial which is important, the Sword Out 9 trial, and this was a large all-commerce trial in more than 3,000 patients of the BioFreedom device, 120 micron stainless steel, uh, no polymer, um, Biolimus A9 eluting stent, versus our CSIRO, a state-of-the-art 60 micron cobalt chromium PLL-based bioabsorbable polymer Sirolimus eluting stent. All comers, but they used the normal durations of DAFT, either 6 or 12 months, according to stable CAD or ACS. And you can see here, target lesion failure um, uh, was actually not met because it was a little bit greater with BioFreedom than Orsiro. There was no difference in cardiac death. Those numbers looked great with BioFreedom. MI numbers looked very good, but target lesion revascularization was greater at one year with BioFreedom than was TLR. So this was not as potent an anti-proliferative agent, again, because it, uh, anti-proliferative device, because it just doesn't have the polymer to control the kinetics. On the other hand, the stent thrombosis rates were quite low. So it was a very safe device, but not quite as potent as a, um, a state-of-the-art metallic drug eluting stent. Now, the question has come up, you know, well, what about just current generation drug eluting stents? These are quite anti-thrombogenic and uh, with the thin struts, with the rapid endothelialization, with the biocompatible polymers, there's um, a lot of evidence from registries that one to three months of DAP should be just fine with these devices. So recently we have the Stop DAP 2 trial, which was a 3,000 patient study in Japan with few exclusion criteria, except no patients who are on oral anticoagulants, randomized to one month versus 12 month DAP after Zion's Everolimus eluting stents and 90 Japanese centers. Um, now, it's important to note that even though this was an all-comers trial, it was, they enrolled very simple lesions. The mean syntax score was eight. These were mostly short focal lesions, and they also used intravascular imaging in 98% of the cases to ensure optimal implantation. Nonetheless, and not surprisingly, one month DAP versus 12 month DAP certainly reduced Timmy major bleeding. Uh, you could see it was 1.5% with um, aspirin and uh, clopidogrel for 12 months and 0.4%. Here they used just clopidogrel alone, not aspirin alone, clopidogrel alone. So 75% reduction with uh, um, Timmy major or minor bleeding by reducing DAP from 12 months to one month. What about the efficacy? Well, the efficacy showed non-inferiority. But again, look how low these event rates are. 2 to 2.5% because these were very, very simple lesions. So clearly we need a different randomized trial in a, um, uh, if you will, westernized uh, um, a population or much higher risk population, the kinds of patients in India, the kinds of patients in the United States, Europe, et cetera, where we would expect these MACE rates in an all-commerce population to be more in the 6% range to see if there's no difference between one month DAP and 12 months DAP. So with that in mind, there's 10 ongoing studies of three months or less DAPT for patients at high bleeding risk with contemporary drug eluting stents. And four of these are randomized trials, and I actually list them here. Um, we're very excited about this top one, the Honest One randomized trial. 
because this is basically taking the biofreedom drug coded stent, which is really now the standard, and randomizing 2,000 patients to the Resolute Onyx drug eluting stent. And this is going to be in an all comers population, and all the patients are getting only one month of dual antiplatelet therapy. And we'll have these results as a late breaking trial at TCT 2019. So I hope you'll be able to join us in September in, gosh, just about two months from now at TCT for the exciting Onyx One results. There's also the Evolve Short DAP Registry looking at Synergy with three months of DAP. This is a single arm registry, but 2,000 patients, and this will be also presented at TCT. So it's going to be a very important meeting to learn more about short term DAP with contemporary DES. Now, what about bioresorbable scaffolds? Well, most of you know this long history. And the rationale for bioresorbable scaffolds was that metallic drug eluting stents result in an ongoing risk of very late events. And this is a lifelong risk arising from the stented site that we think is due to the underlying metallic device. They also cause suboptimal outcomes in special situations, such as high rates of stent thrombosis and ACS. They jail side branches forever in bifurcations, create full metal jackets and diffuse disease, and necessitate an extra layer if, of the metal if treating instant restenosis. In addition, it's just undeniable that a permanent implant is just not desirable for many patients or physicians. And it would be nice, like a cast, to have a device that's there when you need it during the restenosis process and then is gone thereafter. So this issue of the ongoing lifelong risk of stent-related events is an important one. Uh, we've looked at 17 randomized trials of different stents, 22,000 patients. And here you can see with five-year follow-up, as we've gone from bare metal stents in red to first generation DES um, to second generation DES, you can see clearly the one year target lesion failure re event rates have gone down. But if you look from one year to five years, the TLF events, these are events arising from the target lesion. These are either target vessel MIs or stent thromboses or restenoses, continue to accrue at about 2% per year. And it really hasn't changed from as we've gone from bare metal stents to second generation drug eluting stents. Our Japanese colleagues have followed patients with bare metal stents out to 20 years and they find this same 2% per year event rate after year one that continues for 20 plus years. So this may be the consequence of having a metallic stent in your coronary artery. And these are often very dramatic late thromboses or restenoses. So, bioresorbable scaffolds were designed to overcome these very late events once the scaffold is gone, because then there's nothing at the um, uh, a stent site to incite these very late events. So what do we know from the absorbed device, which of course is the most widely used bioresorbable scaffold? Um, hopefully Ashok Seth is there and, and many of our colleagues in India are extensively investigated these devices. Well, we know from pigs that by three years, there's absolutely no more poly -L lactic acid present at the site. And we know by OCT in humans that the dissolution rate is essentially the same. The few autopsy studies um, that have ever been done are, um, after three years have all never shown any trace of PLLA material except for one case where there was a, a minuscule amount that was being able to be detected by GLC. We know that this is what an artery looks like five years after a metallic stent. The metal stent will never go away. The vessel can't get any larger. So as tissue accumulates over time, as it invariably does, it can only encroach on the lumen. Now this lumen is well preserved, but you'll note that we're already getting neoatherosclerosis development inside this tissue. That is the tissue uptakes lipid and it can transform into an unstable phenotype and then rupture. This, on the other hand, is the goal. This is an absorbed five years after it's been implanted. And you can see there's minimal fibrosis. There's no evidence whatsoever of the device. This device can vasoconstrict, vasodilate. It can accommodate more tissue by growing outward. So it doesn't have those limitations. And we know that bioresorbable scaffolds are the only devices that actually allow the artery at the treated site to grow over time. So here's three lesions at six months. They're irregular, they're healing, and then at five years, the lumens are actually larger. So this is some real advantages that are theoretical. 
Unfortunately, in the absorbed randomized trials, there were four main trials, 3,389 randomized patients, and then some outside investigator-sponsored trials, and they all showed the same thing. That within three years of the implant, which is the period of the active absorption of the device, target lesion failure rates are higher with absorbed compared designs by about an absolute 3%. And this is because mostly of device thrombosis. An excess risk of device thrombosis, almost a fourfold higher risk. Um, it's not a terrible absolute risk, it's about 1.7%, but it's still a fourfold higher risk, and nobody wants to have a device thrombosis. Now, this is really too bad because, uh, because of this, these devices have stopped being commercialized for the most part, and we didn't get to see whether or not the long term outcomes would actually be better. Well, we now have the four year data from the absorbed trials. And you saw, this is the TLF curves that are expanded. You can see how, how they're getting worse and diverging at three years. Well, what happens at three years once the polymer's gone? Well, interesting then, there doesn't seem to be any difference in target lesion failure anymore. And in fact, when you look at stent or scaffold thrombosis, not only are the rates no different, but if anything, you can see a 0.1% rate with the scaffolds compared to 0.2% with metallic stents. So it does seem that once the device is gone, we're going to start to get similar or perhaps even better outcomes. Of course, we need much longer term follow up. And at TCT this year, we're going to have the five year final data from the absorb randomized trial. So we'll see if the results start diverging in favor of bioresorbable scaffolds. So how can we improve the BRS outcomes before their complete bioresorption? I can't unfortunately go into this in great detail, but we've learned that we can improve the implant technique. We were naive in thinking that these should be implanted just like bare metal stents. We need to use special bioresorbable scaffold uh, uh, implantation techniques, which have been summarized as PSP, appropriately prepare the lesion, appropriately size the stent, appropriately post-dilate aggressively, we should use intravascular imaging, and perhaps we need prolonged act, although that's less certain. But also we need to improve the device. This first generation devices were very, very thick strut. They were prone to fracture. They didn't have good expansion characteristics. We need thinner struts with improved mechanical properties. And there have been many, many better devices that have been developed. The first bioresorbal scaffold started at over 200 microns in thickness, and now they've come down to 80 microns in thickness. So really as thin as mo many contemporary metallic drug eluting stents. Unfortunately, the um, commercial pressures that have been put on these devices have led many of them to disappear. And these are kind of the ones that are left. We are hoping that Abbott will come back out with the Absorb Generation 2, which is codenamed Falcon, which is less than 100 microns. Um, we, the, it's been announced that there will be peripheral intervention studies done with this device, and we're cautiously optimistic that there will be coronary studies as well. The magnesium um, erodible um, uh, magmaris device is at 120 microns and is still enrolling patients. Uh, this, of course, is a metal absorbing stent, not a polymeric stent. The Riva Phantom is 125 microns, and this is a, a visible device. You can actually see it and it has stent-like expansion characteristics. And then there's the Merrill Mirez 100, which at 100 microns is the thinnest of all those devices currently being used and has had good results to date. So we'd like to see more studies with these devices. So if I was going to summarize, I would just say it's been an extraordinary four decades of the evolution of PCI going from balloon angioplasty to bare metal stents, then first and second generation metallic drug looting stents, Newer stent designs have been introduced. There have been a lot of twists and turns, and I'm absolutely convinced that we're going to continue to improve outcomes with these newer designs and that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stone. That was a masterful uh, uh, lecture, uh, you know, really encompassing 20 years of data in about uh, 35 minutes. So thank you very much for that. I will open it up to any questions from the audience or from the panel. Um, it's, it's late in the hour, and uh, um, Dr. Stone, uh, this is Dr. Vijay Bang from Mumbai. Would like to know. Hello. Is, uh, you you have uh, 
uh, very well elucidated the entire right from beginning of the first tent to the last and the future also. But what is your take on the uh, totally absorbable stain? Well, I, again, I am cautiously optimistic that if we can improve the early outcomes, which I do think we can, by having thinner struts, better expansion properties, intravascular imaging to implant them, to ensure that they're opposed to the vessel wall, that I actually do think that the very long outcomes are going to be better. Uh, you'll see some of the five-year data at TCT, which of course is, is embargoed. It will hopefully be a late-breaking trial, so I can't say anything. Uh, but again, you started to see what is happening between three and four years. Uh, we'll see what goes on at five years. But I think there is an advantage to not having the device present uh, after it's not necessary anymore, which is about three years. And I'm hoping that the uh, companies and the investigators will stick with it because it's the major way I think we have to be able to change the lifelong prognosis of patients with PCI. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The other question I had for you is, th with the third generation stents, the, the outcomes are so good. The threshold to improve on them is so high. How much, of a, how much pressure is that on any of the newer devices in terms of the magnitude of the trials and the cost to meet that, and how is that going to be a problem for us for the future? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, to really see non-inferiority uh, with a reasonable non-inferiority margin, if you want to do an all-commerce trial, you probably need at least 2,500 patients, if not 3,000 patients. Uh, you can make that smaller by enriching it, by enrolling mostly um, uh, you know, higher risk or more complex lesions. But I think what the what has happened is that the current generation metallic drug eluting stents are so good that it certainly has put um, uh, pressure on the manufacturers to not further iterate them because it's going to be hard to make them much, much better. Can we get them down to 30 microns or 40 microns? Will that make a difference? And if so, how will we be able to demonstrate that? For example, um, are there better antiproliferative agents? We haven't found anything better than the Lymus drugs right now. Can we use pro-healing compounds such as endothelial uh, progenitor cells to capture circulating EPCs? Well, we haven't seen that that's made a big difference right now. Uh, but nonetheless, we're treating millions of patients with PCI around the world. So to me, to have to do a two or 3,000 patient randomized trial, or even larger, 5,000, 6,000 patients, should not be a big deal. What's probably more important is to figure out how to make these randomized trials less expensive so we can make them larger and get the kind of endpoints that we need. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, the entire audience here appreciates it. Thank you again, and uh, with that, we'll sign off. Thank you again, Dr. Stone. My pleasure.